Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. This is the weekend edition where we interview notable people from the world of real estate investing. Today is no exception. We have a great guest all the way from Salt Lake City, Utah. Welcome to the show, Amy Johnson. Hi, thanks, Victor, for having me. Great to have you here. Now, you and I are business partners. We work together on lots of projects all over the nation. And what I thought would be interesting to discuss today is what's happening in the world of municipal politics. But before we do, maybe give a little bit of your backstory and how you got to this point in your journey. Sure. I actually was a school teacher before I got into real estate. I love to teach. That's a passion of mine. I taught at high school, uh, finance and foods and nutrition, actually. And and slowly moved out of teaching. I didn't really care for the politics of teaching. Um, I felt like it got in the way of the students and went more to like the county setting of teaching WIC or individuals that are struggling or on affordable housing instead, and then went into real estate. Since then, I've moved on from just doing residential real estate to larger projects, storage units, uh, multifamily, and development. So it just was kind of this, I, I have a residential team that my husband operates for me now, and I solely focus on these larger investments. That's awesome. Now, when we think about undertaking development projects... There's this idea that there's a rule book and you go to city hall and you check the boxes and you submit your application. And as long as you adhere to the rules, you should be good to go. And sometimes that's true, but not always. Yeah. And I've come across that on my own personal projects. And I think we've come across that on, on our projects that we work on together. Now I used to have this utopia thought of the world also thinking like, all I need to do is solve a need for a city. If there's a need in the city I and I solve it as a way to fix it, that I should pass with flying colors. And my ignorant eyes, I guess, were open in finding that that wasn't the whole story. It wasn't only about fixing a need to get something passed. Or maybe the need was perhaps outside your field of view that there were needs beyond just the specifics of what's tied to your project. Yeah, exactly. And that there's a multi-layered approach about, I, I was looking at it singularity of just looking to fix the one need and not looking at all the needs associated that a city does have to juggle and work with to be a viable, profitable city and not be you know in debt. We've seen over the last couple of years, we've seen situations where municipalities have increased taxes dramatically, they've increased impact fees, they've put a moratorium on new development applications simply so that they can figure out how they're going to engage the development community. So they basically press a big red pause button and saying, we need to figure out how we're going to work with development. So we're just not going to look at any applications for the next 180 days while we figure that out and then come back to us then and we'll have a new rule book. We've seen all sorts of things like that that kind of defy the conventional wisdom. Yeah. And I've worked with, in my opinion, some successful cities and some cities that have, we'll just said, struggled with the development process. And I think the largest factor was that the successful cities allowed for outside information of research instead of we'll figure it out all on our own. They've asked for opinions and said, hey, okay, we're just a city municipality. We might not know all the factors. Explain what have you done in other cities that have made it become a win-win situation? I, I feel like that's been the key factor in making the city being a little bit more successful instead of them just stonewalling or stopping all development because they do, the cities need development if they're going to grow or maintain their population and not be stagnant. So new development does need to happen, but smart growth is dependent upon if the city is allowing for additional outside feedback instead of just looking inside. I'll give one example. In my home city of Ottawa, Canada, and of course, as a developer, I'm certainly pro-development, 
there was one golf course that was created as part of an open space, green space agreement with the city as part of the original development. And then that golf course was acquired by a developer who basically tried to argue that that original agreement was invalid and basically wanted to build 1,500 homes on that golf course. Court case ensued. Uh, City council was opposed. The local community association was opposed. In the end, I don't know if the story is fully played out yet, but my sense is that the community won, the original agreements were upheld, and uh, that developer was essentially trying to overreach. And unfortunately, those types of situations, when they occurred, they do give the development community a bit of a bad name in terms of perhaps creating the perception that greed is more important than doing the right thing for the community. And I know that in my dealings with you, it's been quite the opposite. And yet, sometimes even that's not enough to convince the community. Yeah, and that we've come across that where, for example, I won't use the word affordable housing, but attainable housing, if we were able to do certain X, Y, and Z steps to help bring attainable housing. And then I've had cities say to me directly, those type of people, and I you know, would put air quotes there is what they said is, we don't want them to reside in our, in our city. Those are for the neighboring city, which is kind of shocking, you know, that you would hear that from city where I'm not even saying affordable, I'm just saying attainable to be able to, so that individuals could actually afford, our school teachers could be able to afford to live in our same city that they teach in. So I have come across there and I have, my eyes have been opened a little bit and realizing that you do have to play the game a little bit more in using local representatives that already have that camaraderie of trust. We're not having to go over the trust barrier. If I use somebody in the community that the city already trusts and knows, it allows me to It's one extra step I don't have to obtain on just one city council or planning commission meeting. And it's it's been a pivotal point. Before, I used to always be a little bit frustrated. Why can't I speak for my own project? Am I not doing a good enough job? And I realized it's not about myself. It was about that fact that there's one less barrier that we have to overcome in the city council or planning commission meetings that they already know and trust this local individual that's local, hyper-local into their community. And and so if they're supportive of that project, then it must not have any backwards or a different alternative motive. If you're an outsider in a community and you want to get an audience with the mayor or a city councilor or the school commissioner or whoever might be important to solve a particular problem, they might not take your phone call or it might take a very long time to get that meeting set up. Whereas someone who already has the relationship, they might go to the front of the line. They might be able to get a meeting with the mayor on two days notice that you might not be able to yourself. Or just the formality of the meeting as well. If they're an individual that's well known in this in the community, maybe they're running across and having an informal meeting at a lunch place or breakfast or on the golf course or on a hunt or, you know, any of those things, depending on the city, they might be able to get the the listening ears of the mayor or city council on those side conversations. At the end of the day, when you want to get into the city council meeting or the planning commission meeting, If you are having to change people's minds at that meeting, you've probably already lost the game. You want to go into that meeting with consensus and a sense that there should be no surprises at that meeting. Absolutely. And for example, like city council, like put yourself as a city council member. And I've never, I've never seen the development before, or I I don't know about any of the issues, or I haven't read any of the things. I may not even understand exactly where the property is. If that's the first time I'm hearing about the property, you could see that I'd be a little bit more apprehensive about approving that property. If it has come in front of me, if I've if I've been asked my opinion about the project, or I've done a work session with the developers. And I am more comfortable or I understand 
and I am more familiar. Then when it comes to the actual meeting night, I can I can address my real issues and be able to feel comfortable about a vote. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of having a land use attorney that's very well connected in the community who can call up the city attorney and negotiate with the city attorney directly where you, perhaps you as a developer might not have that latitude? Yeah, I think it goes back to relationships. If you have a well-known land use attorney and they are familiar and already have a relationship with the city attorneys as well, first of all, it brings validity to your project. It's It means these guys know what they're doing. They mean business because I have had cities skirt around or think, well, that developer doesn't really know what they're doing or maybe we can get by with this. And the minute I have an attorney on my side, it's like their standards are a little bit higher. That's number one. They, they're like, okay, we got to make sure everything is done up to speed. But the second part is the fact that my attorney can then just talk to the city's attorney goes back to breaking down that barrier of they know what they're talking about, that we need to be closer to the law, actual procedures that they need to take. You have to remember that city council is basically voted in by, I mean, it's the public individual. So we have, even though I'm, you know, like I used to be a school teacher, so I'm not discounting a school teacher, but there could be school teachers. They could be just good members in the community, but it doesn't mean that they have a master's degree in land planning or in parliamentary procedure of how, you know, how the meeting even is supposed to take place. So the fact that you have a lawyer associated with helps keep everything in line and what should happen. I love it. Well, Amy, if folks want to connect, if they want to learn more, what's the best way? Yeah. uh, Whystreetcapital.com. You can click on there and there's, um, if you want to do an individual one-on-one game plan session um, to see where you want to go with your investments, if you want to be part of a development that we're working on or any other project, that's the best way. Or amyj at whystreetcapital.com. Send me an email and let's let's talk see how we can help each other awesome well amy love the perspective and it was really through a lot of your efforts that we got so deeply immersed in development projects across the number of communities that we're involved in so for the listeners at home definitely connect with amy at ystreetcapital.com link will be in the show notes in the meantime have an awesome rest of your weekend go make some great things happen we'll talk to you again tomorrow